பகுதி உங்களுக்கு பிடிச்சிருந்தா மறக்காம லைக் பண்ணுங்க ஷேர் பண்ணுங்க கமெண்ட் பண்ணுங்க சப்ஸ்கிரைப் பண்ணுங்க நன்றி வணக்கம் வாழ்க வையகத்தோ லெட்ஸ் பிகின் வித் இன்ட்ரோடக்ஷன் ஆல் ஆஃப் அஸ் ब्रीத் டு லிவ் பட் வை இஸ் ब्रीதிங் சோ எசன்ஷியல் டு லைஃப் வாட் ஹேப்பன்ஸ் when we breathe also do all living organisms including plants and microbes breathe if so how all living organisms need energy for carrying out daily life activities be it absorption transport movement reproduction or even breathing where does all this energy come from we know we eat food for energy but how is this energy taken from food how is this energy utilized do all foods give the same amount of energy do plants eat where do plants get their energy from and microorganisms for their energy requirements do they eat food you may wonder at the several questions raised above they may seem to be very disconnected but in reality the process of breathing is very much connected to the process of release of energy from food let us try and understand how this happens all the energy required for life processes is obtained by oxidation of some macromolecules that we call food only green plants and cyanobacteria can prepare their own food by the process of photosynthesis they trap light energy and convert it into chemical energy that is stored in the bonds of carbohydrates like glucose sucrose and starch we must remember that in green plants too not all cells tissues and organs photosynthesize only cells containing chloroplasts that are most often located in the superficial layers carry out photosynthesis hence even in green plants all other organs tissues and cells that are non green need food for oxidation hence food has to be translocated to all non green parts animals are heterotrophic that is they obtain food from plants directly herbivores or indirectly carnivores superphytes like fungi are dependent on dead and decaying matter what is important to recognize is that ultimately all the food that is respired for life processes comes from photosynthesis this chapter deals with cellular respiration or the mechanism of breakdown of food materials within the cell to release energy and the trapping of this energy for synthesis of atp photosynthesis of course takes place within the chloroplasts in the eukaryotes whereas the breakdown of complex molecules to yield energy takes place in the cytoplasm and in the mitochondria also only in eukaryotes the breaking of the cc single bonds of complex compounds through oxidation within the cells leading to release of considerable amount of energy is called respiration the compounds that are oxidized during this process are known as respiratory substrates usually carbohydrates are oxidized to release energy but proteins fats and even organic acids can be used as respiratory substances in some plants under certain conditions during oxidation within a cell all the energy contained in respiratory substrates is not released free into the cell or in a single step it is released in a series of slow stepwise reactions controlled by enzymes and it is trapped as chemical energy in the form of atp hence it is important to understand that the energy released by oxidation in respiration is not or rather cannot be used directly but is used to synthesize atp which is broken down whenever and wherever energy needs to be utilized hence atp acts as the energy currency of the cell this energy trapped in atp is utilized in various energy requiring processes of the organisms and the carbon skeleton produced during respiration is used as precursors for biosynthesis of other molecules in the cell 14.1 do plants breathe well the answer to this question is not quite so direct yes plants require o2 for respiration to occur and they also give out co2 hence plants have systems in place that ensure the availability of o2 plants unlike animals have no specialized organs for gaseous exchange but they have stomata and lenticels for this purpose there are several reasons why plants can get along without respiratory organs first each plant part takes care of its own gas exchange needs there is very little transport of gases from one plant part to another second plants do not present great demands for gas exchange roots stems and leaves respire at rates far lower than animals do 
Only during photosynthesis are large volumes of gases exchanged and, each leaf is well adapted to take care of its own needs during these periods. When cells photosynthesize, availability of O2 is not a problem in these cells since O2 is released within the cell. Third, the distance that gases must diffuse even in large, bulky plants is not great. Each living cell in a plant is located quite close to the surface of the plant. This is true for leaves, you may ask, but what about thick, woody stems and roots? In stems, the living cells are organized in thin layers inside and beneath the bark. They also have openings called lenticels. The cells in the interior are dead and provide only mechanical support. Thus, most cells of a plant have at least a part of their surface in contact with air. This is also facilitated by the loose packing of parenchyma cells in leaves, stems and roots, which provide an interconnected network of air spaces. The complete combustion of glucose, which produces CO2 and H2O as end products, yields energy most of which is given out as heat. If this energy is to be useful to the cell, it should be able to utilize it to synthesize other molecules that the cell requires. The strategy that the plant cell uses is to catabolize the glucose molecule in such a way that not all the liberated energy goes out as heat. The key is to oxidize glucose not in one step but in several small steps enabling some steps to be just large enough such that the energy released can be coupled to ATP synthesis. How this is done is, essentially, the story of respiration. During the process of respiration, oxygen is utilized, and carbon dioxide, water and energy are released as products. The combustion reaction requires oxygen. But some cells live where oxygen may or may not be available. Can you think of such situations, and organisms, where O2 is not available? There are sufficient reasons to believe that the first cells on this planet lived in an atmosphere that lacked oxygen. Even among present-day living organisms, we know of several that are adapted to anaerobic conditions. Some of these organisms are facultative anaerobes, while in others the requirement for anaerobic condition is obligate. In any case, all living organisms retain the enzymatic machinery to partially oxidize glucose without the help of oxygen. This breakdown of glucose to pyruvic acid is called glycolysis. The term glycolysis has originated from the Greek words, glycos for sugar, and lysis for splitting. The scheme of glycolysis was given by Gustav Inden, Otto Mierhoff, and J. Parners, and is often referred to as the EMP pathway. In anaerobic organisms, it is the only process in respiration. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell and is present in all living organisms. In this process, glucose undergoes partial oxidation to form two molecules of pyruvic acid. In plants, this glucose is derived from sucrose, which is the end product of photosynthesis, or from storage carbohydrates. Sucrose is converted into glucose and fructose by the enzyme, invertase, and these two monosaccharides readily enter the glycolytic pathway. Glucose and fructose are phosphorylated to give rise to glucose 6-phosphate by the activity of the enzyme hexokinase. This phosphorylated form of glucose then isomerizes to produce fructose 6-phosphate. Subsequent steps of metabolism of glucose and fructose are same. In glycolysis, a chain of 10 reactions, under the control of different enzymes, takes place to produce pyruvate from glucose. While studying the steps of glycolysis, please note the steps at which utilization or synthesis of ATP or, in this case, NADH and H plus take place. ATP is utilized at two steps. First in the conversion of glucose into glucose 6-phosphate and second in the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. The fructose 1 6 bisphosphate is split into dihydroxyacone phosphate and 3 phosphoglyceraldehyde. Gl. We find that there is one step where NAD plus H plus is formed from NAD plus, this is when 3 phosphoglyceraldehyde Gl. is converted to 1, 3 bisphosphoglycerate, BPGA. Two redox equivalents are removed, in the form of two hydrogen atoms, from Gl and transferred to a molecule of NAD plus. Gl is oxidized and with inorganic phosphate to get converted into BPGA. 
the conversion of BPGA to 3-phosphoglyceric acid, PGA, is also an energy yielding process. This energy is trapped by the formation of ATP. Another ATP is synthesized during the conversion of PEP to pyruvic acid. Can you then calculate how many ATP molecules are directly synthesized in this pathway from one glucose molecule? Pyruvic acid is then the key product of glycolysis. What is the metabolic fate of pyruvate? This depends on the cellular need. There are three major ways in which different cells handle pyruvic acid produced by glycolysis. These are lactic acid fermentation, alcoholic fermentation and aerobic respiration. Fermentation takes place under anaerobic conditions in many prokaryotes and unicellular eukaryotes. For the complete oxidation of glucose to CO2 and H2O, however, organisms adopt Krebs cycle which is also called as aerobic respiration. This requires O2 supply. Pre-fermentation In fermentation, say by yeast, the incomplete oxidation of glucose is achieved under anaerobic conditions by sets of reactions where pyruvic acid is converted to CO2 and ethanol. The enzymes, pyruvic acid decarboxylase and alcohol dehydrogenase catalyze these reactions. Other organisms like some bacteria produce lactic acid from pyruvic acid. In animal cells also, like muscles during exercise, when oxygen is inadequate for cellular respiration pyruvic acid is reduced to lactic acid by lactate dehydrogenase. The reducing agent is NADH plus H plus which is reoxidized to NAD plus in both the processes. In both lactic acid and alcohol fermentation not much energy is released, less than 7% of the energy in glucose is released and not all of it is trapped as high energy bonds of ATP. Also, the processes are hazardous, either acid or alcohol is produced. What is the net ATPs that is synthesized? Calculate how many ATP are synthesized and deduct the number of ATP utilized during glycolysis, when one molecule of glucose is fermented to alcohol or lactic acid. Yeasts poison themselves to death when the concentration of alcohol reaches about 13%. What then would be the maximum concentration of alcohol in beverages that are naturally fermented? How do you think alcoholic beverages of alcohol content greater than this concentration are obtained? What then is the process by which organisms can carry out complete oxidation of glucose and extract the energy stored to synthesize a larger number of ATP molecules needed for cellular metabolism? In eukaryotes these steps take place within the mitochondria and this requires O2. Aerobic respiration is the process that leads to a complete oxidation of organic substances in the presence of oxygen, and releases CO2 water and the large amount of energy present in the substrate. This type of respiration is most common in higher organisms. We were 14.4 aerobic respiration. For aerobic respiration to take place within the mitochondria, the final product of glycolysis, pyruvate is transported from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria. The crucial events in aerobic respiration are the complete oxidation of pyruvate by the stepwise removal of all the hydrogen atoms, leaving three molecules of CO2. The passing on of the electrons removed as part of the hydrogen atoms to molecular O2 with simultaneous synthesis of ATP. What is interesting to note is that the first process takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria while the second process is located on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Pyruvate which is formed by the glycolytic catabolism of carbohydrates in the cytosol, after it enters mitochondrial matrix undergoes oxidative decarboxylation by a complex set of reactions catalyzed by pyruvic dehydrogenase. The reactions catalyzed by pyruvic dehydrogenase require the participation of several coenzymes, including NAD plus and coenzyme A. During this process, Two molecules of NAD are produced from the metabolism of two molecules of pyruvic acid, produced from one glucose molecule during glycolysis. The acetylco then enters a cyclic pathway, tricarboxylic acid cycle, more commonly called as Krebs cycle after the scientist Hans Krebs who first elucidated it. 14.4.1 Tricarboxylic Acid Cycle the TCA cycle starts with the condensation of acetyl group with oxaloacetic acid, OA, and water to yield citric acid. 
The reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme citrate synthase and a molecule of CO is released. Citrate is then isomerized to isocitrate. It is followed by two successive steps of decarboxylation, leading to the formation of alpha-ketoglutaric acid and then succinyl CO. In the remaining steps of citric acid cycle, succinyl CO is oxidized to allowing the cycle to continue. During the conversion of succinyl CO to succinic acid a molecule of GTP is synthesized. This is a substrate level phosphorylation. In a couple reaction GTP is converted to GDP with the simultaneous synthesis of ATP from ADP. Also there are three points in the cycle where NAD plus is reduced to NADH and H plus and one point where FAD plus is reduced to FADH2. The continued oxidation of acetyl CO via the TCA cycle requires the continued replenishment of oxaloacetic acid, the first member of the cycle. In addition it also requires regeneration of NAD plus and FAD plus from NAD and FADH2 respectively. The summary equation for this phase of respiration may be written as follows, NADH plus H plus. We have till now seen that glucose has been broken down to release CO2 and 8 molecules of NADH plus H plus, 2 of FADH2 have been synthesized besides just 2 molecules of ATP in TCA cycle. You may be wondering why we have been discussing respiration at all, neither O2 has come into the picture nor the promised large number of ATP has yet been synthesized. Also what is the role of the NADH and H plus and FAD2 that is synthesized? Let us now understand the role of O2 in respiration and how ATP is synthesized. 14.4.2 Electron Transport System, ETS, and Oxidative Phosphorylation the following steps in the respiratory process are to release and utilize the energy stored in NADH plus H plus and FADH2. This is accomplished when they are oxidized through the electron transport system and the electrons are passed on to O2 resulting in the formation of H2O. The metabolic pathway through which the electron passes from one carrier to another is called the electron transport system, ETS and it is present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Electrons from NAD produced in the mitochondrial matrix during citric acid cycle are oxidized by an NADH dehydrogenase, complex I, and electrons are then transferred to ubiquinone located within the inner membrane. Ubiquinone also receives reducing equivalents via FADH2, complex 2, that is generated during oxidation of succinate in the citric acid cycle. The reduced ubiquinone, ubiquinol, is then oxidized with the transfer of electrons to cytochrome C via cytochrome BC1 complex, complex 3. Cytochrome C is a small protein attached to the outer surface of the inner membrane and acts as a mobile carrier for transfer of electrons between complex 3 and 4. Complex 4 refers to cytochrome C oxidase complex containing cytochromes 1 and A3, and two copper centers. When the electrons pass from one carrier to another via complex I to 4 in the electron transport chain, they are coupled to ATP synthase, complex V, for the production of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. The number of ATP molecules synthesized depends on the nature of the electron donor. Oxidation of one molecule of NAD gives rise to three molecules of ATP, while that of one molecule of FAD2 produces two molecules of ATP. Although the aerobic process of respiration takes place only in the presence of oxygen, the role of oxygen is limited to the terminal stage of the process. Yet, the presence of oxygen is vital, since it drives the whole process by removing hydrogen from the system. Oxygen acts as the final hydrogen acceptor. Unlike photophosphorylation where it is the light energy that is utilized for the production of proton gradient required for phosphorylation, in respiration it is the energy of oxidation reduction utilized for the same process. It is for this reason that the process is called oxidative phosphorylation. You have already studied about the mechanism of membrane-linked ATP synthesis as explained by chemiosmotic hypothesis in the earlier chapter. As mentioned earlier, the energy released during the electron transport system is utilized in synthesizing ATP with the help of ATP synthase, complex V. This complex consists of two major components, F1 and F0. 
The F1 headpiece is a peripheral membrane protein complex and contains the site for synthesis of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. F0 is an integral membrane protein complex that forms the channel through which protons cross the inner membrane. The passage of protons through the channel is coupled to the catalytic site of the F1 component for the production of ATP. For each ATP produced, 2H plus passes through F0 from the intermembrane space to the matrix down the electrochemical proton gradient. 14.5 The Respiratory Balance Sheet It is possible to make calculations of the net gain of ATP for every glucose molecule oxidized, but in reality this can remain only a theoretical exercise. These calculations can be made only on certain assumptions that There is a sequential, orderly pathway functioning with one substrate forming the next N with glycolysis, TCA cycle and ETS pathway following one after another. The NADH synthesized in glycolysis is transferred into the mitochondria and undergoes oxidative phosphorylation. None of the intermediates in the pathway are utilized to synthesize any other compound. Only glucose is being respired. No other alternative substrates are entering in the pathway at any of the intermediary stages. But this kind of assumptions are not really valid in a living system. All pathways work simultaneously and do not take place one after another. Substrates enter the pathways and are withdrawn from it as and when necessary. ATP is utilized as and when needed. Enzymatic rates are controlled by multiple means. Yet, it is useful to do this exercise to appreciate the beauty and efficiency of the living system in extraction and storing energy. Hence, there can be a net gain of 36 ATP molecules during aerobic respiration of one molecule of glucose. Now let us compare fermentation under aerobic respiration. Fermentation accounts for only a partial breakdown of glucose whereas in aerobic respiration it is completely degraded to CO2 and H2O. In fermentation there is a net gain of only two molecules of ATP for each molecule of glucose degraded to pyruvic acid whereas many more molecules of ATP are generated under aerobic conditions. NADH is oxidized to NAD plus rather slowly in fermentation, however the reaction is very vigorous in case of aerobic respiration. 14.6 Amphibolic Pathway Glucose is the favored substrate for respiration. All carbohydrates are usually first converted into glucose before they are used for respiration. Other substrates can also be respired, as has been mentioned earlier, but then they do not enter the respiratory pathway at the first step. See figure 14.6 to see the points of entry of different substrates in the respiratory pathway. Fats would need to be broken down into glycerol and fatty acids first. If fatty acids were to be respired they would first be degraded to acetyl-CO and enter the pathway. Glycerol would enter the pathway after being converted to PGL. The proteins would be degraded by proteases and the individual amino acids, after demination, depending on their structure would enter the pathway at some stage within the Krebs cycle or even as pyruvate or acetyl-CO. Since respiration involves breakdown of substrates, the respiratory process has traditionally been considered a catabolic process and the respiratory pathway as a catabolic pathway. But is this understanding correct? We have discussed above, at which points in the respiratory pathway different substrates would enter if they were to be respired and used to derive energy. What is important to recognize is that it is these very compounds that would be withdrawn from the respiratory pathway for the synthesis of the said substrates. Hence, fatty acids would be broken down to acetyl-CO before entering the respiratory pathway when it is used as a substrate. But when the organism needs to synthesize fatty acids, acetyl-CO would be withdrawn from the respiratory pathway for it. Hence, the respiratory pathway comes into the picture both during breakdown and synthesis of fatty acids. Similarly, during breakdown and synthesis of protein too, respiratory intermediates form the link. Breaking down processes within the living organism is catabolism, and synthesis is anabolism. Because the respiratory pathway is involved in both anabolism and catabolism, it would hence be better to consider the respiratory pathway as an amphibolic pathway rather than as a catabolic one. 14.7 Respiratory Quotient 
Let us now look at another aspect of respiration. As you know, during aerobic respiration, O2 is consumed and CO2 is released. The ratio of the volume of CO2 evolved to the volume of O2 consumed in respiration is called the respiratory quotient, RQ, or respiratory ratio. The respiratory quotient depends upon the type of respiratory substrate used during respiration. When carbohydrates are used as substrate and are completely oxidized, the RQ will be 1, because equal amounts of CO2 and O2 are evolved and consumed, respectively. When fats are used in respiration, the RQ is less than 1. When proteins are respiratory substrates the ratio would be about 0.9. What is important to recognize is that in living organisms respiratory substrates are often more than one, pure proteins or fats are never used as respiratory substrates.